Perfect. And yes, let's begin. Over to you, Colleen. Take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This is one of my favorite topics, and I've had a chance to give this, this talk a few times, and so I've been able to refine it and tweak it just like we do in our retros. Um, and I'm really excited about some of the improvements that I've made, made to it over the last couple iterations and, and to be able to share it with you all tonight. So let's dig in here. Um, let's see if my slides will advance. Uh, my name is Colleen Johnson. Like Ahmad said, I'm the founder and CEO of Scatterspoke and the CEO of ProConbon.org. Um, I live in Denver, Colorado. I've been really involved in the Agile community here in Denver through Agile Denver and the Mile High Agile conferences. Um, I also served on the board of directors for the Agile Uprising. My most important job is mama to these three. They are now 3, 11, and 13. This picture feels so long ago, <laughs> um, but they keep me on my toes. They keep me really busy. We spent most of our summer um, road tripping around the US to visit all the family that we hadn't seen in a while because of COVID. And um, everybody just started school last week. So we've been going to bed at like 8.30 p.m. in this house. I think I might love it more than the kids, but um, that, is, that is me. Um, I am really excited to talk to you guys tonight about what, what, how we can make our retros better by using data. I think probably for most of us on this call, we're pretty familiar with what a retrospective is, right? It's, it's, it's an opportunity on a regular basis to come together as a team and talk about our process, our products, our performance, how we communicate with each other um, and how we deliver value and how to find opportunities for improvement in there. And improvement is a broad term in this sense, you know, it's not always that there's a problem that needs to be fixed. Um, in some cases, it's finding a bright spot and figuring out how do we amplify that bright spot? How do we keep doing something that's really working well for our team? There's a lot of different reasons why we have retrospectives, right? We want to look at how we're working, how we're interacting. Um, but I think there's this underlying layer too of retrospectives where we're learning how to talk to each other as a team. It's having hard conversations, it's building trust. Um, I have a great friend who became a scrum master a couple of years ago. And I remember she called me and said, is it normal for people to cry in a retro? <laughs> I said, you know, I've, I think I've seen tears. I've seen somebody throw an eraser. I've seen people storm out. I've seen all different kinds of emotions in retrospectives. And that's because it, I think it takes, takes a lot of processing of what's going on. And there's a personal element to processing all of that emotion and feeling comfortable sharing it with your teammates. The other underlying part of a retrospective is um, establishing ownership. And so as you're working through this, um, this, this building this safe place and building a place of trust with your teammates, we're also looking at how does a team take ownership of their process and take ownership of how they deliver um, so that the process fits their needs. Um, as we go through these retros, we start to move towards what we, we've all heard um, described here as a Kaizen mindset. And that is that we're, we're the loose translation of making bad points better. So how are we constantly looking at how we can improve? Our work's never really done here and we're using our retros to keep coming back and saying, what's one small tweak we can make to keep improving the way that we work together? Now I'm gonna share this list of action items with you and we're gonna go through these and kind of talk about them. These are real action items from retros that I have run in the past. And I think there's an underlying issue with this list that we're gonna walk through. So I'm gonna read them and I want you guys to think through each one of these and see if you can find a problem with these action items. So we have set up a meeting to discuss the branch process, clean up user stories as stuff changes mid sprint, define more clear acceptance criteria in JIRA. I love that one. Dedicate time for developers to study topics and new tech related to their work. Review sprint burnup chart as part of our daily standup. Stop rotating the scrum master role. More liberal permission to view infrastructure settings so we can resolve issues faster and include QA folks in sprint planning. What do you guys see here? What, what might be wrong with some of this, some of these action items? They're very, fam they're probably very familiar and very typical to what we often have, but what's wrong with them? What's, what could we improve? There's nobody assigned to do them or a time frame. Nobody assigned, no time frame. I see in the chat, not specific enough, no ownership. Mm 
no why, our problem's not clear. These are all true, right? So they might not be specific enough. We don't have a, an idea of our why or what we're trying to improve. But I think at its core, these are very binary action items. They're either done or not done. And so we typically pull our, our action items up to kick off our retro. And we might go back to that list and say, did we set up a meeting to discuss the branch process? Yes, cool, that's done. Did we um, make more liberal permissions in the infrastructure settings? Yes, that's done. So going back to some of the comments that you guys posted here in chat of what is our why, and Pippa, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head here. There's no way to measure the improvement because we don't have a clear idea of what we're trying to change or why. So what we wanna talk about today is how can we shift, to shift the way that we look at our retros to use data to help us identify the improvements, but also use that data to help us create better action items that are almost more of an experiment. So when we think about that difference there, <laughs> Jose is giving data the thumbs up. Um, what we wanna do is try to figure out what kind of data, we like what data is important for us to review. I'm gonna give you a, a handful of examples today. No surprise, they'll be fairly Kanban focused. Um, the data that you need to review for your team is gonna be different based on the work, based on your systems, based on your process. But the important part here is that we're starting these retros with some data around how, how we're currently working. This helps us identify really targeted improvements. So we're not guessing. Um, you know, I think there's a variety, I should say there's a, a, a plethora of retrospective formats out there, not just a variety. There's so many to pick from. And so many of them are fun, but sometimes I think they're very superficial, right? We end up talking about like, we wish we had more snacks or we wish we could go get beers. Um, and we're not really talking about the way we work or how we're working together. And so using this data, I think helps steer you towards more um, objective, uh, objective views of how the team is working. And when we look at this, we wanna look at data that's blending both our internal process as the team and how we're delivering externally. And that can be, you know, maybe your customer for your team is, an, is a services team is internal employees. So who is your customer and how are they um, receiving the value that you deliver? So we have two areas of focus here, data into our retro and data out of our retro. And when we're looking at the data coming into our retro, we wanna think about this as an alarm bell. What's the indicator that's driving our change? And like I said, this doesn't have to be bad. This alarm bell probably makes us all think of like a fire alarm or an emergency, but maybe something's improving. And that's an indicator for us that we wanna keep doing that or amplifying that behavior. And then we also wanna look at data out. So as we make small adjustments to how we work, how do we know that that, that adjustment's working, right? How is it delivering that result like Pippa said? in the chat, how will we know that the changes we're making are doing what we want them to do? So this is gonna look familiar and, and there are so many variations of this kind of format, but what we wanna move towards is looking at our action items as a hypothesis. This is gonna feel a lot like the plan, do, check, act circle from Lean. So what impact do we expect our change to have? How will we measure, right? And then when will we check back in? I think Frederick, you said it doesn't have a date. Um, when we think about those due dates, we often tend to think about is the work item done, right back to those binary check the box type action items. But if we can combine how, how will we measure it with how long we want to wait before we come back to that measure to check it, then we're starting to say in a month, we hope to see the result of this change manifest with this, um, with this data point. So we are going to try something today, tonight, for you guys, <laughs> called the Retrospective Hypothesis Canvas. And so I've come up with four terms here that we're going to use to kind of test out different data points, and we'll, we'll look through a couple different data in, right? What's our cue? Um, try to come up with a change and a check, 
and then a way to correct um, if there, if we need to make an adjustment to that um, to that change. So the first thing here is our cue. What's the indicator that we need to change our behavior? That we need to change what, how we're working. Um, and we'll talk a little bit even about feelings here too. That can be a cue and we can quantify some of that to an extent. I think it can feel very subjective sometimes when there's a lot of emotion in the room. So we'll look a little bit of how can you quantify um, some of the feelings coming from your team to be a really concrete cue that we need to change. And then what's the change? What are we gonna change about our behavior or our process? What's the thing that we need to test? What are we gonna try? Um, I try to frame all of my action items as let's try it, especially if I can feel that there's like apprehension in the room. Um, sometimes the changes can be things that I don't necessarily support. And I try to give the team the autonomy there to make the change as long as they can tell me how we'll measure that it's working. Um, so I had worked with one team. It was a security team who dealt with a constant flood of tickets coming in for security issues. And they felt like they could do more work at the same time and said, we'd like to up our, our whip limits for the tickets coming in to 30 tickets per person. And I was like, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. I'm fail like this is a fail, fail on my part, right? And I said, what do we, how do we think that will change the way that we're working? And how will we measure that it's having the effect that you think it will have? Um, so I let them do this and we kind of ran it as an experiment for 30 days to see the impact of increasing the whip by that much. Um, probably no surprise, their cycle times went way up. A lot of work was sitting. They were assigning tickets to themselves where no work was happening. Um, I call that ticket squatting. <laughs> so all this, that, all this stuff came out of that process, but they learned a lot about being able to try something and check the data to see the output. And so I probably give teams a little more flexibility with this than, than maybe leadership would always feel comfortable with, but I think there's, there's a lot of learning that can come and giving the team the opportunity to try something as long as they can tell you why they think that change will work and how they'll measure it. And then the last step here is correct it, right? So I think um, one of the things we can do better in our retrospectives is when we come back and say, did this fix deliver the, de the desired results? So we're measuring the fix. Um, it's not just a binary answer here either of yes, it did or no, it didn't. It might be that it delivered half of the results that we thought it was going to or a fraction of, you know, a fraction of the improvement in whatever direction we thought the numbers were going to go. Um, so what do we tweak next? How do we keep these living improvements so that they don't just die every two weeks when we come back and say, are they done? Yes, move it out of our, you know, move it out of our queue and come up with a new list. If we break this down into kind of two categories, our queue and our check are our data. So our queue is our data in and our check is our data out. And our actions are our change and our correct. So what change are we going to try and what tweaks do we need to make to that, to that change to how we're working? So our queue drives our change and our check drives our correct. And now the fun part. So we're gonna go through six categories here of different data in. So these are different cues you might look at um, from your teams and we're gonna play around with this format. Um, I'm gonna walk through the first example for the big three and then I'm gonna ask you guys to come off mute and help me build a great canvas for some of these other ones. Um, full disclaimer, these names that you see for the data are fully made up. <laughs> so these are what I like to call them. Um, we're gonna look at the big three piles, outliers, blockers, unplanned work, and all the fields. Um, so let's start with the big three. Um, when we talk about the big three here, we are looking at cycle time, throughput, and the actual work in progress. And when we look at these numbers, these are usually a great baseline for us to be able to take, take a snapshot of how the team is working and how much work they're doing and the impact that's having on how they deliver. Um, I want to pause for a second. I see a question from Maru. Um, are these analyses done as a team or together with an agile coach or flow coach or with somebody else? Um, these are absolute, that's a great question. These are absolutely done as a team. Um, 
typically a flow coach or a scrum master is the one pulling a lot of this data together. I think a great goal for us as, you know, as a coach or as a scrum master is to figure out how to get a lot of this data visible to the team without us being the, the shepherd, <laughs> because the more data we can put in front of them and make that pull base too, then they have access to see um, all of this, all of this information at any time. Great question. All right, so back to our big three. So let's look at this view. Um, this is from a tool called Actionable Agile. And this is one that's going to give us a quick snapshot of how our team is, what, how much stuff our team is working on and the impact that's having. So I can see here in the center box, our team currently has 35 items in progress. I can see in the left that our cycle time right now is 16 days or less for 85% of the work that goes through our system, which means 15% may take longer than 16 days. And then down at the bottom, you'll see in the middle there of that chart, we have throughput. And I can see that our throughput rate is 2.24 tickets a day. So those are our big three, cycle time, WIP, and throughput. What is this telling us though? So this, these numbers are great. What is it telling us? It might be telling us if we're delivering value fast enough, Will we meet a deadline, right? If we have a fixed date project, if our cycle time is going up and we forecasted a date um, for a specific delivery target, it might be telling us that we're not gonna hit that date with the current scope that we have if, if our work is slowing down. It might also tell us that we're working on too much or too little as a team, right? 35 items in progress sounds like a lot for this team, so we might wanna talk about, is there an opportunity to um, maybe throttle that down and focus a little bit more. It might also be telling us that our whip is inconsistent. So if that's jumping around and, and moving all over the place, that's gonna have a direct impact on um, the amount of work and the time it takes to do that work. What changes could we make? So, um, you know, we could agree to follow our, our, our system whip limits. Um, we could increase or decrease system whip limits. Um, you could take a look at your exit policies and say, where, where is work moving ahead in our workflow where maybe it shouldn't have moved forward and it's getting stuck? Um, I see this a lot where teams drop their, you know, they might drop their, um, their grooming sessions out of their conversation and then they're pulling work from the to-do column and then going, we don't know what this is. We don't have enough information or we don't understand this acceptance criteria. And the work gets stuck there because they don't have policies to define what, what work that's ready to pull should look like. And they might have policies around how to expedite work items. That's a whole different bag of worms as Jose knows. <laughs> um, so what could we do with this? So let's go back to this Canvas approach. So what's our cue, what's our change, what's our check, and what's our correct? I'll, I'll team one up here. So I think your cue for addressing the big three could be that the amount of work in progress has jumped up and down. So we're moving all over for our work in progress. Maybe we started with three, we went up to eight, down to, 10, or down to six, up to 15. Or, so the volume of work in our system is moving around a lot over the last 15 days um, or over the last 30 days. So if that's the case, we might say the change we wanna test is that we're gonna agree to stick to our WIP limits and checking the total items at stand up to keep them consistent for at least 30 days. So we have a time to come back and we have a way, we have a, a change that we're gonna test out for that 30 days. And maybe in 30 days, we come back together and we say um, that we, our check was that we were gonna hopefully reduce our cycle time for 85% of our work items to go from 12 days down to eight days. Maybe that was where we had started back from a couple months ago. And let's see if that works, right? If that didn't work, we might say our cycle time is trending down, but work is stuck in just one stage. So we're going to adjust the WIP per stage while keeping our overall system work in progress consistent. So this is just one example. There's probably a ton of different little things, right? Little knobs to turn in this process of things that you could test out based on a, based on a signal like this um, and some data into your system around these metrics. Let's try the next one. Um, I like to refer to this as piles. Nobody likes piles, piles of laundry, piles of leaves, piles of dog dew. But I think the only piles, piles of laundry, um, 
we only like piles of cash, I'm guessing, but um, who has cash anymore anyway? Um, piles, let's talk piles. Okay, so um, this is where you can use a cumulative flow diagram. It's probably one of my favorite ways to show a team if they are experiencing a pile up in their system without having to say a whole lot to just visually show them um, where, that, where that pile is happening. Um, this means that work is accumulating in one area of our workflow. And um, you might see that your whip as a team is consistent over time, but one area of your process gets overburdened or one person on your team gets overburdened. This can happen when you have strong areas of specialty in your team um, and maybe somebody's idle and somebody's frantic. I, I started my career in in QA, so I would spend, Q, not just QA, but waterfall QA. Um, and so I would spend about nine months out of the year playing ping pong, and then three months out of the year living off gas station coffee, trying to test everything all night to get the deployments out the door. And so when you think about this, you know, in a lot of ways, we see this same pattern in micro, you know, micro sizes now, even inside of a sprint. So you might have developers work for, 10 days of the sprint and then push everything to QA all at once. And then QA is frantically trying to get everything tested and done before the sprint is over. So this is that is where you might start to see piles in your system. And here's an example of what this might look like. Um, I tried to be tool agnostic here. So you'll see that there's a variety of different screenshots from different, um, different tools. This is a screenshot from a tool called Combinize. And you'll see here, we've got some work that's where you can kind of visualize where work is piling up. So if our orange phase is waiting on link, you can see right here um, where the, just underneath that horizontal line, a lot of the work moved into that phase. And then something kind of looks like it happened here as the, as the orange box gets smaller, that pile gets cleared out and then moves to green. Um, a lot of times when we see like a, a pile grow and shrink that can be indicative of a batch process somewhere in our system so often if we're doing like two week deployments or monthly deployments and this ready for delivery is a great example of that you might see a lot of work pile up and ready for delivery and then clear out once that deployment is done so that might be a great opportunity to talk about piles with this team to say what happens here is there you know is there something happening when we're waiting on this link where all of this stuff is piling up um, and then doesn't get cleared out until it can all be cleared together. Um, what, what is this telling us? What are piles telling us? Um, they're telling us where maybe work is piling up in our system. Um, it can be an indication that maybe we need more capacity for that function or for that specialty. Um, it might also tell us we need to throttle a different part of our workflow, maybe upstream to that part. And it can also be an indicator that we need to modify our workflow policies. So looking at how work is moving through, um, like that example of pulling work in that's not really defined enough to act on can be another example of, of, of a policy change that would help you not pull things in that aren't truly ready to work on. Let's see, what changes could we make? Um, we could increase or decrease state whip limits. Um, and this is where having more granularity in your states and in your whip limits might help you see where those help you manage those pile ups a little better. Um, we could look at hiring more people and addressing gaps in specialization. If hiring is not an option, maybe pairing is and starting to knowledge share. And then we can also try to visualize our aging work. So a way to see that something on the board is getting too old. I've even done this in JIRA. Um, we called it a, you know, there's the dots on the JIRA tickets to show you that the work is aging, but sometimes, um, and depending on how your team responds to those dots, you can get a little numb to them changing color across the bottom and they can be a little hard to quantify. Um, I worked with one team where we had a, what we called a stale story button. And so if a story had aged past a certain number of days, the end of stand up, we would hit our stale story button and it would filter everything off the board that, um, was we would only see stuff on the board that was like 10 days or older. So having a great way to see um, how old work is getting on your board can help you address those piles sooner. So let's do this one together. I'm gonna give you a cue. Work is piling up in a ready for test column. What's a fix that we could, what's a change that the team could make, an experiment we could run to try to adjust um, 
how we're working if we're if we see works piling up and ready for tests. Feel free to come off mute. It's a maybe safe maybe increase uh, whip on in testing in the next next stage. It could increase, yeah. And what that and one thing to think about there is if we increase whip in test without increasing the capacity to do more testing, and I see somebody wrote automated tests here, we might be pulling things in and creating a pile in test where work isn't really happening. Any other thoughts? Increase team members. Oh, train developers to test. I, I want to hug you. <laughs> Yeah, these are all great options. You know, another one could be um, eliminate the ready for test column altogether, right? If things have to stay in the development column until test is ready to pull those, you could say we're gonna test out um, keeping things that are ready in the dev active column and test will pull from there. And then you're creating a constraint around the number of items in the dev column. These are all great options. Let's take, um, <laughs> let's take, let's see, which one do I wanna stick with? So if we if a, we put a whip limit on the ready for test column and that's our change to to work on here, how would we measure that that is working? Ah, Maro, you've got a good a good point here. Let's drill into that. Um, Maro said they will just stay in the dev column then and pile up there. What's our fix for that? So let's say we did that. Let's say we put a whip limit on the ready for test column, and now we've got a pile up. We've, we've created a new pile in our dev column. So we're just pushing our we're pushing our log jam further to the left. It sounds like. Um, so maybe we measure how long things are sitting in that um, ready. For, we put a whip limit in place, and our fix is we want to measure how long things sit in our ready for test column. Um, and our correction is to um, have developers who have capacity and cannot pull new work in to help clear things from the test column. That could be a small tweak to make. Um, that pain is real. I like to tell everybody when we talk about, you know, when, whenever you're whenever you're dealing with these ty types of constraints that are going to prevent people from pulling new work in, there is a panic that sets in. <laughs> like, you, are you telling me you don't want me to keep working? If everything's blocked and I can't pull in new work, what am I supposed to do? Um, before I got into technology, I worked in restaurants and in many restaurants in the back side of the house in the kitchen, there's signs everywhere that say, if you can lean, you can clean. <laughs> so that's what I always tell everybody. I'm sure there's something you can contribute to, to the greater good of this team to um, help us be more efficient and more productive without starting new work. So let's look at our next item here. We're going to talk about outliers. And what do I mean by outliers? So outliers are a way for us to see, you know, I talked about like if 85% of our work is done in a certain amount of time, what's going on with that other 15%? Um, sometimes these can be really interesting to dig into. And this is a delicate game in a retro. Um, what we don't want to do is pull up a ticket and say, it looks like this one ticket out here, this outlier took us 45 days. Ahmad, what were you doing? Why did this take you so long? <laughs> um, so what we want to focus in here is on the process. When we're looking for how can we improve our efficiency, it's very, very rarely, I would say almost not at all, about making people work faster. It's about finding where work is sitting in our system and nothing is happening, right? It's about the process and the waste in that process. And so when we start to look at outliers, we want to talk about the causes of why the work got stuck. Um, one of the things I like to do when we pull up a, a scatter plot, and we'll look at one here in a minute, is to ask everybody to get their calendars out. <laughs> Tell me what was happening during this two-week period. Um, maybe somebody was out sick. Maybe somebody um, was on vacation during that time. And so that gives us an opportunity to do something based on that data then, right? We've got an idea of an event. We can measure the impact that had on our work. And we can start to talk about how we would mitigate that in, in the future from happening again, instead of me just 
singling Ahmad out and asking him, what, what were you doing? <laughs> so if we look at this um, scatter plot, this is from JIRA. Well, it's actionable agile in JIRA. So I'm cheating a little. Um, here is our 85% line. So this team gets 85% of their work done in 16 days or less. And then up here, I have some outliers that took us quite a bit longer than 16 days. This one that is, is highlighted here took 31 days. And so you can expand on these outliers and look at how much time did it spend in each state of our workflow. And I might be able to drill into this and say, it looks like it spent us, uh, you know, it spent, it spent 10 days sitting in um, Deb done. We can keep coming back to that ready for test type column. What could we do to help us make sure that our outliers aren't getting, you know, that, that our work, our process isn't contributing to these these outliers growing. So what's it telling us? What's this data telling us? It might tell us how much variability we have in our flow and what's causing that variability. Um, a great conversation to have is how can we reduce it? What do we have control over here and how can we reduce it? And is work moving through that isn't going through all states of the workflow, right? Um, maybe you have spots where things are jumping around in your workflow and that's adding to um, adding to the amount of time it's taking to complete them. What changes could you make based on this? So we might, uh, we might revise our workflow policies, revise the workflow states, um, increase the priority of aging items on our board, or we might try to pair or knowledge share so that outliers aren't getting stuck with a single, you know, a specialist on the team where only one person can do that item. So let's apply our canvas to this one. Let's do our queue change, check, and correct. So if our queue, our signal of need is that major outliers are, are um, to our cycle time are driving up our 85% number and increasing our variability between those percentages, what's something we could try to test out a change to what the team is doing? See decrease whip. That's definitely a change you could try. Oh, Frederick, you're speaking to my heart here, buddy. Um, look at work item age. Yep. Cluster the work items and find out metadata. Yep. And let's drill in a little bit to that work item age, right? One of the things when I'm coaching teams, um, I think especially new, oh, I like that one too, smaller, um, similar sizing. So maybe smaller sizing up front, right? Getting things as small as possible to move through the system. Um, when we talk about work item age, and, and I think in so many ways, this is a fault of our tools and not of our process. We tend to look at work item age and it's like, Oh, yep, that's old. We just keep having that same conversation for a couple of weeks about something aging. Um, and I think when we start to think about the concept of implementing an SLE or a service level expectation, um, which can sound a little heavy, depending on how your team works. Sometimes I just refer to this as a target cycle time. So maybe that's the change you wanna implement here. As a team, we're gonna have a target cycle time or an SLE of 10 days. And let's say a ticket goes over 10 days, what are we gonna do, right? What's the action that's gonna drive us to take? I always wanna have the team have a working agreement around the actions they're gonna take so that it's not just, yep, that's older than 10 days. That card turned red. Maybe that card turned red 30 days ago. So it's 40 days old now, but it's been red, you know, because it's older than 10 days. But we wanna, what we could do here is say, we're gonna have the SLE that if a card ages over 10 days, we're gonna stop and look at the ticket and try to split it into smaller items. And if we can't split it, we're gonna swarm it. Um, yep, I see somebody else posted swarming here too. So maybe we come back then and we say, in 30 days, we're gonna measure if our cycle time and our out, specifically the number of outliers starts to decrease based on this action that we're gonna take around aging work. And maybe if it doesn't, um, if it doesn't, prove to be working from your team, a correction could just be some really some really great public shaming. <laughs> I had one team where we had a workflow policy that if your ticket had aged past our SLE by more than two days, that you had to sing a Broadway show tune to the rest of the team at Stand Up. <laughs> you know, that is really, really motivating to not have to sing in front of 
in front of others. Um, I'm half joking here, but I think that you can come up with great policies here for your team around how to really respond to the data around work item age. So that's a fun one. Next, next let's talk about blockers, everybody's favorite subject. So when we're looking at blockers, um, there's a concept called blocker clustering, which sounds very sexy and scientific, and it's not. It's just <laughs> creating some groups of blockers. Where did these come from? And these can be different for everybody. Um, I think the most common one is internal versus external. I'll show you another example here in a moment. And what we want to do once we've grouped our blockers here, done this blocker clustering activity, is say, what are the risks? What are the likelihoods? And what are the impacts of these different types of blockers that come our way? Um, doing a root cause analysis, or a five whys on these blockers can be a really effective way to drill into the specific things that contributed to these blockers taking place. So if we were to look at this example, and this is from a tool called Swift Kanban, you can see this team has um, come up with a lot of different types of blockers. They have task switching, on hold, external dependency, member on leave, not enough information, whip exceeded, so this is giving them enough information to see all of the different types of blockers. Um, probably no surprise here that it looks like the one, the, the, highest, the highest type of blocker for this team is task switching. So if we were to take this data and say, it looks like of all of the blockers that come to us, more than 50% of them are related to task switching, what would that be telling us, right? It's telling us why the work is getting blocked and what the most frequent blockers are. It might be telling us that we need to escalate or increase visibility. Maybe these are like third-party blockers that are going to another team so we don't know the status of them anymore. And we could discuss whether or not these are risks that we could mitigate as a team. Um, so what changes could we discuss? As a team, we might say, don't hide what's blocked, make it visible and make it painful so we have to address it. Make sure all the work is in one place. Um, make external blockers visible to that group. That one's kind of a favorite of mine. I, you know, when I work with a lot of teams where they'll say, you know, our work is always blocked by this other team and, um, you know, we'll work on a ticket and it goes to them to review and, um, and, and we can't do anything until that review comes back. One of the things that I often find out is that that ticket's not visible to the other team. It stays on the home team's board. So how do you make sure that the group that's blocking has that work visible to them? Another option could be around revising workflow policies, right? And putting policies in place to have to address those blockers, just like we did around the SLE for responding to a number of days that a ticket has been in progress. We could have a, a workflow policy around a number of days that a blocker is in flight and what action we would take for that to resolve that blocker. So let's do our queue change, check and correct. So if our queue here is, oh, I didn't fix this one, okay. Ignore that. <laughs> That's from our other slide. Um, let's say, let's go back to the example we had from the data here. And we'll say that um, our cue here is that most of our blockers are coming from task switching. Um, what's something we could change about the way the team is working and how would we measure that it's, that it's delivering the right results? A workflow policy around task switching, yep. Limit whip. You could probably just put that answer in for each one, right? <laughs> for every one of these. Ask for help, yep. I worked with one team where they were really struggling with um, like, uh, somebody would own a ticket and never ask another person for help and so it, it became like this was my ticket even if I struggled with it for 40 days and they would sit on it and sit on it and so we had them take all the assignees off the tickets so at stand up we really had to talk about the work and talk about organizing around the work as a team without it being my ticket or or Frederick's ticket or Marika's ticket we had to really focus on um, the work to be done it was kind of a fun change not work on items blocked and delegate solving with outside authority. Yeah, a change policy. 
yeah, so these are all options, right, of things we could do. And we could put in a measure here. This one's a pretty cut and dry measure. We could say, does this change decrease the number of blockers as a result of task switching? And if it does, maybe the correction is to continue or in increase this change or, or um, fix that we put in place. If not, maybe we try a different one out. All right, our next one here, um, and this is, I think, a very common one I run into in coaching teams is unplanned work. So when we think about unplanned work, what we're looking at is, um, and this can be very straightforward or very complex, just like your blocker clustering, um, how much work comes to your team that's planned versus unplanned? Um, how long does it take us to respond to the unplanned work? And there's no right answer here. Maybe for one team, it takes them three days to pull in an unplanned work item. Um, and maybe that's an acceptable amount of time for that. Maybe for another team, a security team, the response time for unplanned work needs to be very low. So what we wanna look at here is um, the response times to pull that work in and what impact does unplanned work have on planned work? Is that an acceptable amount of impact to have? And, and like I said, this will vary a lot from team to team. This is a screenshot from a tool called Focus Objectives, and it's just looking at the differences here in the cycle time that it was taking to complete um, planned versus unplanned work. So you can see as we look out here, this is the amount on the horizontal axis, we're looking at the time that it took to complete these items based on the frequency of items. So the further out we go, the longer it's taking us um, based on the frequency here. So if we kind of drill in in the center, we can see when our unplanned items start increasing, that gray bar starts to catch up with the orange bar, it's taking us longer to deliver. So what's this telling us? Um, should we throttle the entry point? Um, maybe that, and we'll talk about that in a second here. Can we put a whip limit on our to-do column potentially so that we can um, focus on the type of work coming to our team? Um, are we exceeding our capacity or in, or in another way of saying that would be, do we have enough slack in our system to respond to this unplanned work, right? Is there enough wiggle room in the, in the capacity and the whip limits that we've put in place for us to absorb this work when we need to? Um, do you need a different allocation for um, different work item types, planned versus unplanned? Um, I'd love to hear from Jose or anybody else here if you've had a great way to do this. Um, I tend to try to do it through allocating capacity in the to-do column. If this is required, like we're gonna have 20% unplanned, 80% planned work, it can be a little hard to manage, um, especially in JIRA, uh, but I try to color code it so you can visually see it. But of course, like all things, the more work in progress you have, the harder it is to manage that allocation. Um, and then like what impact is, is unplanned work having on our, our wait times? So what could we change? Um, other than making your standups walk, walk the work in flight, the second thing I recommend the most is putting a whip limit on your to-do call. <laughs> it's like the, one of the quickest bangs for your buck, right, in terms of changes you could make. Um, you could also create those allocations, like I said, for pulling work in and say, you know, for this team, we don't want to exceed 20% of our, our whip at any given time for unplanned work items. Um, you know, I, I've been doing a lot of work recently with security teams and security orgs. They tend to be the opposite, right? It's like 80% of our work is unplanned, but we want to make sure 20% of our work gets to be planned efforts or planned work items. Um, you can go back and look at state whip limits. And then I think another great thing to look at here is looking at the difference between your lead time and your cycle time. How long are things sitting in the to-do column before they get pulled in? And that can be an indication that you're over planning a little bit. You're batching too much work into that to-do column and then unplanned work is constantly trumping what you've queued up. So stuff is starting to age out in your to-do column before you even pull it in. So let's apply our, our Q change check and correct. Our Q here is unplanned work items are increasing and causing us to delay starting on planned work. What could we try changing? I hope everybody's quiet because you're all having a beer <laughs> or, or a glass of wine. 
celebrating the end of your day. So I'll team one up here. I think one of the things I mentioned on your, yeah, whip limits or swim lanes for unplanned work, work policy on unplanned combined with, yep, whip limits. Someone's just pump, pump, putting whip limits for each one. Plan less work, yeah. Yeah, and one thing, you know, I really like to focus on um, putting whip limits on the to-do column to help drive down the focus of the team and create more opportunity to reprioritize on a, on a more frequent basis. Um, this leave buffer is, is exactly where I was headed. So I might tell a team, we wanna put a whip on our to-do column of four. Let's not prioritize more than four tickets. We might have a minimum whip of two. So maybe you can have two items here, but you don't have to have four. So we always have two spots available for unplanned work. Um, and that recommendation is going to depend on the volume of unplanned things that come to a team and how quickly you need to be able to respond to them. So you might try a change like that, a whip, you know, putting a min max whip on your to do column and measuring to see if that helps um, keep your unplanned work moving quickly through the system and helps reduce the impact of it of the time that it's taking to complete your planned items. And then you can adjust up or down as needed. Maybe your allocation changes a little bit based on the data and you say, we're gonna say one item's always available for planned and three items are always um, available for unplanned. All right, this last one is still important. I love data, I love looking at all these metrics. There are human beings doing this work. And so we still have to check in on how people feel. Start with appreciations and your retros. Um, especially right now, it's, this is all unprecedented in territory that we're in with COVID. It can feel disconnected. It can feel, um, you know, I, I think every the burnout levels are high across the board. Um, make sure people know that you appreciate the things that they're doing. Um, I think the prime directive is still a great place to start a retro to say, regardless of what we're going to discuss here today, we all believe that everybody did the best that they could. Give everybody a chance to be heard. Um, Listen for cues of exhaustion. I think this is a big one right now. And I talked about emotion coming up in your retros, but when, when the team, when you can hear that on balance in a retro where um, one person feels like they're carrying the burden of the rest of the team, that is an opportunity for you to bring the team together to talk about how to balance that, that, uh, that load around the team and um, acknowledge others' emotions. I think, um, I think this is really hard to do over Zoom. Um, it's hard when you're not face to face with other people to see their body language and see how they're, you know, how they're coming to the table. Um, this is my sh shameless plug here. Um, this is data from Scatterspoke um, that is running uh, a natu natural language analysis tool over all the cards put into your retro to tell you the sentiment of your team's data over time. Um, so there's some other, you'll see some other charts in this view, action items, time to close action items, um, themes, sentiment by theme and topics. But if we focus on this center chart here, what I wanted to focus on is look at this team's sentiment, right? So you can see um, it was very good until about February. And then the, the negative sentiment way outweighed the positive sentiment until about March, and then it switched again. Um, so this is a great opportunity as a coach and as a facilitator of a retrospective to say, how are we, what, what happened during that period where maybe the team was feeling overloaded? Maybe they had a deadline they were pushing against. Maybe they were feeling stressed. Maybe we were down a couple people on the team. Um, Oh, and I see Gabriella, this is, uh, this is from Scatterspoke. It's a retrospective tool. So it is pulling the, um, it is pulling the sentiment chart based on the text on the retrospective cards. So what is this telling us? Um, is our team gonna quit? <laughs> I think that's probably a really good one. Are people maxed out, right? Um, I think in a lot of cases, one of the things that comes up when we start talking about feelings is are, are our policies clear and agreed upon? I might have an expectation that Pippa is supposed to do this thing and she's not doing it. And so I'm really frustrated with her. But when we start talking about it, she's like, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. <laughs> so this is always a good chance when we start talking about those frustrations to make sure your workflow policies or your exit policies are really clear and agreed upon. 
Um, where could we swarm? How can we help each other? <laughs> and are we really focused on delivering as a team? Um, I think sometimes those burdens and, and that sense of overburdening can be really felt when there's you know, a hero in the team that feels like they're carrying the weight for everyone else. What changes could we make? Um, create policies to encourage swarming. Um, I worked with one team where we had, we took everybody's names out of JIRA and we had pairs. So it was like Bert and Ernie, peanut butter and jelly. Um, we had all these famous duos and that's what moved around on the tickets. So you would, you were part of a pair to swarm on the work. Um, I talked earlier about removing owners on work items. So we're really talking about the work and where can people contribute. Reduce whip or add capacity to your team. Uh, this last one's so important. Find a way to celebrate what gets done and celebrate your achievements as a team. So this is our last one here. Q changed, check and correct. If that was your team's data and you saw that your team feedback was consistently trending towards a more negative sentiment, what's something you would try to change? Maru, I want to work on your team. <laughs> Maru said limit whip to zero and send everyone to Morocco on holidays. <laughs> More beers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and Frederick, you said try to ask why. I mean, I think um, really making space for that conversation of why are we feeling this way? It feels like, yeah, something's demotivating the team. What's happening here is going to give you an opportunity to um, identify a fix to try and to try to measure that fix, right? Um, so that you can say, um, it feels like we're in kind of a negative space right now. Um, one of the things that you could try changing too is um, doing a safety check at the beginning of your retro, asking everybody, do we feel safe in this space, talking and being honest with each other. Um, team building, right? That's a great one too. Let's get out, well, depending on where you're located, let's get out and, and get beers together in person. Um, let's see, I attended a talk on the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Oh, and they, everyone started coaching at least 30 minutes a week. That's amazing. Um, yeah, so what are the things that we could do here to try to get this team in a, in a better headspace and how would we measure it, right? And, and the measure here could just be that our sentiment chart is starting to trend um, back up in a more positive direction. So I think as much as I love all this data, don't forget that there's people doing the work. Um, I think both of these things have a place in your retrospective. So look at um, look at data and feelings together and think about what impact have the changes had on your on your output or on your outcomes and how is it moving the needle up or down? Um, when you hear people in your retro say, um, I think things are better or worse or faster or slower, ask how we can measure it. How do you know? Is there a number that we could use if you feel like we're slowing down as a team? Like, let's dig into that. What evidence do we have for that? Um, and how will we know anytime they want to try something and try to embrace your inner Colleen here going forward and see if you can be, let them kind of fly wild with their possible improvements. If they can tell you how they'll know if it's working, right? What's the measure of, of improvement? Um, measure, rinse, and repeat. There's always some room for improvement. Um, even if these are very small, right? I, I feel like as teams tend to mature, you might have to dig a little bit a little bit more into the data um, and into the feelings of the team to try to find these targeted improvements and try stuff, try new things out. You're, you know, we say this over and over with Agile, our process is never done. It's never perfect. It's never final. Um, I think keeping the team thinking about how to try different things gets them excited to take ownership of their process. And don't skip your retro. There's so much, there's so much opportunity there um, to get your teams engaged. That's everything I have for you guys. Let's open it up and see if anybody has any questions or comments that you wanna share. Where we can have this uh, session because it was recorded, right? Yeah, it is recorded. Yes. Do you wanna take that one? Yeah, I will post the link in chat.
Thank you. Um, just I'll say just just be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon, and it'll send you a notification as soon as the video is uploaded. Thank you. Uh, Mario, you, you touched on an interesting point here when, when we think about trying new stuff. I do try to get the teams to only do <laughs> make one change at a time. Um, it's hard to tell if, if you're measuring the effect of the right change if you change a lot of things at once. And so just like we would say, don't let's not pick eight action items per retro. Let's try one, one hypothesis to test out a change for um, and check back in. Um, one other thing I would recommend around that check back in point too, is for a lot of the changes that we make, you're not gonna see if it worked in two weeks. So I think that that's kind of stuck in our heads that it's a two week cycle here of make a change, check it, make a change, check it every two weeks. And if my team has a cycle time on their stories of 22 days, it's gonna take me a while to see if changing things is having an impact on that. And so um, give yourself some flexibility there in making a longer window to see the impact. You can still check in in, in two weeks or four weeks, but um, make sure you're giving yourself enough time to, to really test and measure the, the, the effects. Ah, that's a cool question. Do you put your action items in the product backlog or in to do? I guess I would say it depends. I'll give you my consultant answer. It depends. Um, I think if you're using, if it's something the team needs to be doing where it's consuming WIP, I would put it into to do. Um, a lot of times, and this doesn't work great with um, being remote, to be honest, but I like to put a, a big sticky note by where, wherever we're doing stand up or somewhere where the team is present, where we can keep coming back to what our focus is for that period of time. So it's almost like our, like our working agreements would be right. And in a lot of these examples, we talked about tweaking working agreements. And so um, wherever you can make that visible, make it your, make it your subject line in your Slack channel, make it your footer in your board title, right? Um, so that you you keep coming back to that thing. Um, I worked with one team that did not have scrum masters. And so they rotated the role. You saw that in my beginning action items or my beginning retro action items. Um, and one of the things that they called the person who was taking on that role for their sprint was Jiminy Cricket. And I was, I didn't, I, came in after that was already in place. And I was like, why do you guys call this, this role the Jiminy Cricket? And they said, because it's the conscience of the team. And that's kind of a cool way to think about some of these things. Like, I'm just, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just holding up a mirror to what you guys said was important to you. So figure out the right way. And obviously we have to get creative now, um, but it's not always that it's a ticket on the board. Maybe it's just something visual where the team is, is congregating a lot to um, keep it top of mind to be that Jiminy Cricket. All right, well, I, I'm guessing I'm, I'm the only thing standing between whatever you have planned for your evening, yeah. Netflix, yeah. beers, dinner. So, uh, okay, can so I go over to you, Ahmad? Yeah, we've got one question that just came in just now. How do you prevent data-driven goals then distorting behavior? Example, create a goal to increase positive sentiment on retro cards. Yeah, the to such points. That's a good question too. Um, you know, I don't think there's any way to prevent that. I mean, you could, for the sentiment, um, it's just looking at the language used. I mean, I think you would probably feel if your team was BSing their way through their retro <laughs> um, based on the conversations. And if you, in that particular case, at least for the way our tool is set up, there's comments that can be added to the cards. Um, a lot of times when I facilitate out of scatter spoke um, and people are talking as we're talking through each card, I'll pull the card up and add the comments to it. So for that, like for that particular issue of, of feeling like they're gaming the sentiment, I would probably add what I thought was the real. <laughs> Once we start talking about it, if it feels more negative, I would add those comments underneath the card. Um, I think with a lot of data, you have to really think through, is there a way to game it, right? And, and is there kind of a, a negative side to the measure? And so I think when you're identifying what your success metric is or what your, what your check is to measure if your fix is working the way you want, um, you have to keep, in, keep that lens, right? And, and that, that's a great question to push back to your team and say, is this, 
is this a valid measure or can we can we game it as a team you might learn some, some interesting feedback from your team in the answer non-data backable possible improvements it's a mouthful um uh, Maro, could you give an example what might be in that I hope my voice is gonna is gonna sound okay. Pretty much everything related to human beings, uh, and that's that's most of the work we do. Um, Eighty percent will have much less to do with the system, with the flow, with anything that like we can um, serialize down to any metric. At least not in a non-trivial uh, way, because it's usually a combined, uh, complex uh, thing. And what about applying your four column? approach uh, to this kind of improvements. You usually working um, as a coach, you have to combine both. Um, I mean, uh, but yeah. <laughs> Jose, that's such a that's great- That's what point. I meant to say. Yeah, Marlo, I think there's a couple things. I mean, I think we struggled with this when we're setting success metrics for pro product deliveries too, right? Um, I think there's some things you could look at that are very simple. Like an MP, like the way we would use an MPS score for a product. There's tools like Team Mood that are just a check-in um, with your team that are anonymous ways to to pull the team every day on are they happy or sad, are they feeling like um, are they feeling like there is um, like they're fulfilled with their work. Um, I've done a fair amount of anonymous surveys with teams like that to try to check things, and I think it still does give you a way to quantify that the human element of things and to check in and to make sure that people have a voice. Um, I've done safety checks at the start of a retro where I've asked everybody like on a scale of one to five, how comfortable do you feel being safe and honest in this environment? Um, and that's a data point for you. You don't necessarily have to share that back with your team, but you could say, here's our total number as a team with how safe people feel in, in being honest in this room. Um, and then back, you know, and use that as a barometer to say are things improving or not improving. But um, I think there's I think there's still some ways to measure that human side of it. You might have to get a little creative and pull a few different things together. Um, you could look at attrition too. <laughs> I think every client I've been working with over the last uh, three, I would say, I don't know, three to six months has just had this like spiral out of people leaving the orgs. And there's probably a lot of reasons for that, but I mean, that's a kind of an indicator too of of happiness and being fulfilled in the work that you're doing. Awesome. On on that note, I think yeah, it's a good time to round things up. I'll say as the comments reflect, um, you know, fantastic session. So many great takeaways. Um, really useful video as well. You know, it's, it's it's almost like it's almost like a textbook where if anyone comes to you and says, "How can I improve retros?" and you give them Polian's video to watch, it's going to make a big difference straight away. You know, so many things that you can pick up and try straight away. Okay, um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for taking time, Caroline, to, to present this session. Thanks to the audience as well for your attendance. Our next meetup is next week, Tuesday. So we've got the boys from C Prime talking about the new business agility um, health check from SAFE. I'll just post a link in there. So yeah, if you're available, pop in. Um, if not, yeah, have a great evening and thank you very much. Thanks, okay. everybody. Bye.